Hi, my name is Rod Espinoza, creator of Adventure Finders, Snow Queen, and a bunch of other titles like Utopia and Prince of Heroes. You are watching Two Geeks Talking. Good morning, afternoon, evening, everyone. Two Geeks Talking is an entertainment industry interview show where we interview the creative people from the comic, film, TV, movie, and video game industries. And of course, I'm your host, Kurt Sasso. We are joined today by a returning guest from 12 hours in the future because, you know, that's how time zones work. He is a very talented Filipino comic artist. Uh, he has done many works in the past. He was on the show last six years ago with Doc as the co-host. We are joined today by the ever talented Rod Espinoza. How are you doing today, Rod? Oh, doing fine, Kurt. Doing all right. Uh, same as everybody else, trapped in these circumstances, I suppose. Yeah, it's it's in a crazy time for not only creativity but for the world as as it is. But speaking of which, um, since it's been six years, obviously a lot has changed in your life besides the pandemic. Uh, from a creative standpoint, what have you been working on? Oh, uh, well, um, let's see. For the past four years, this is, it's been going on for a while. I've been working on a web comic called Adventure Finders. Essentially what it is, is um, it's Lord of the Rings, really, with, with a little bit of a Game of Thrones plotting involved in there. But it's essentially Lord of the Rings just it just has more women and more people of color. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> and in my own way, of course, you know. Yeah. So why did you want to write that particular, or why are you writing this uh, particular series? So I have, I've already done like a science fiction series called Prince of Heroes. And then I came off a number of, a huge number of one shots. Like I did a lot of, uh, steampunk fairy tales so i got a lot of practice out of that i, I did a lot of one shots in terms of uh creating like these uh, short stories of history american history specifically and american biographies mm -hmm. so my entire life from about 2007 or so like that up to around 2013 14 it was around it was a lot of um it was a lot of one shots so my life was full of one shots and i and i did not work on any long series and like it like everything else sometimes the longest series that i did back around 2004 was a uh, was neotopia and that extended like 20 episodes and every time you begin something new, you always like, am I still capable of doing a long form series? I mean, do I still have the staying power mm. or did I get used to all these one shots? Cause it's like one shot, it's over, <laughs> you know, and I don't have to think about the story anymore. And plus a lot of the scripts have been written for me because American history is already a, a done story, so to speak. And so does a lot of the fairy tales. Like uh, I have Snow Queen right here uh, which I self-published in, in, in the Philippines. Nice. Um, it's essentially frozen. Uh, so I I did that as a mini series, but I haven't done a continuing long form series in quite a while. So, and of course, like, like you said, uh, what inspired me was, well, I watched Game of Thrones <laughs> and I said, I, I want a series like this, but you know, I just want it my own way, which is, it'll probably have more elves and more fantastic things and you know because game of thrones didn't have a lot of magic in the beginning so uh what they did have was dragons and i still have to have a dragon in my series <laughs> i've hinted at the presence of dragons but they haven't showed up yet so um and i'm playing it i'm writing them in such a way that they they are who they are you know they're a thousand years old they don't want to show up and be killed or whatever <laughs> by people so it's more like there's so many you have to deal with so many layers of uh intermediaries between you and the actual dragon i mean even in the scripting of uh of adventure finders there's already a dragon involved there since since early on it's just that you're 
you don't see them yet because you're they're they're always acting through all these layers so all these representatives in the field you know and in some ways they are using avatars so uh anyway i haven't revealed too much about that but that's just some inside inside baseball kind of thing where you know they, they, there are dragons involved it's just that they they don't show themselves you know so there's that i mean i got inspired by the, like i said the game of thrones plotting where suddenly something changes you know and in my case the first change that happened was like there's this six-year-old child that just bent the entire series in another direction <laughs> uh but i'm glad to go with those kinds of you know stories as long as they don't get too boring for me or anything like that or they don't deviate too much from what the storyline was i mean that's how adventures begin you know something starts off as a simple matter like they're escorting a bunch of orphans and suddenly they're in the middle of a war and they have to deal with stuff like that you know and i always wanted to write like what happens when the heroes leave you know because they always like the heroes enter town they save the town and then they leave the town <laughs> but um my stories are more like well they kind of stay around and help the town for a while you know we'll, we'll see what the consequences are you know and just like game of thrones there's a lot of consequences because the enemies know other enemies and they the, even the enemies have relatives and contacts <laughs> And behind the scenes, some of the enemies are already talking to each other, going, well, what's going on there? What, who wiped out this detachment? Who wiped out that? You know, so uh, it's kind of come to a head soon in this, this coming year. <laughs> 2021 is going to be a very busy year for, for uh, Adventure Finders, for sure. That's awesome. So based off of Game of Thrones, but do you think you could turn it into, say, a D&D campaign? Uh, yeah, yeah, it is heavily Dungeons and Dragons influenced too, so uh, you can say that it's a it's a mashup of a lot of the genres that I like. Um, essentially, because you know, in in my Patreon, uh, there's a there's a tier called the gaming tier, and the gaming tier, you know, if you enroll in that, you'll actually get the real stats from the beginning, like how they were first level, first level, you know, Clariette and her gang were like first level in the beginning. And they slowly rise through the uh, ranks. Right now they're around level seven or eight, but they're gaining so much items, so many items. And some of them are advancing very rapidly in terms of skill, power, you know. It's a little over, over overpowered, I wouldn't suggest. That's why I put in my gaming supplements. I released the gaming supplements and I said, you know, uh, I wouldn't suggest you use all of this, you know, it depends on your game, you know, but these are just, these are just what happens in my world. Like, uh, like the use of multiple rings, you know, mm -hmm. as you, you and I know that in Dungeons and Dragons, you're only allowed two rings, one on each hand. But in mine, you can see people wearing five rings in one hand kind of thing. And, um, I just balance that out by going, those are all plus ones. <laughs> those are low level rings. <laughs> Instead of giving them one high level ring, I guess you can give them three low level rings. That way the low level would, ring would still be useful at a higher level, but you have to be able to manage that as a GM, you know? So there are certainly some overpowered items that they've gotten recently in, in the story that, you know, I would caution GMs to go, well, I, before you put this in your game, you know, there's always these asterisks, you know. <laughs> all, all, also about, you know, there's a multiple, you know, uh, an automatic crossbow there that um, has a firing rate of six bolts per round, you know. I mean, that's pretty fast. And, you know, the accuracy decreases, you know, yeah. each time. It's just how it is. Unless you have Just to balance it out. But still, I would still go, eh, you know, it's up to you if you want to use it gaming related as well so in that sense you know because i released the stats of even some of the monsters you know and uh, every every episode that i come out with i release the stats of what was involved in that so that's how that's how it is related to dungeon and dragons and how it relates to lord of the rings is because it's a high fantasy story um they just got through what is it they got they just got through like the Rivendell experience, that's what I call it. 
<laughs> you know, they just got, to, I gotta have the Rivendell scene where they pause to, in the middle of the quest, you know, but that's also like its own thing where it just, I did not expect them to do that. Uh, originally the, the journey was just, they're gonna go down river to the city. That was, that was the whole thing. And then of course, in the middle, I just went, well, they're gonna stop over this little town. And then this little town happened to be beset by, uh, you know, history, you know, in history, the Roman army just, whenever it traveled or whatever, any any of these medieval armies in the past, because I'm a big history buff, yeah. whenever they pass by like a certain area, like town or something, they just, they just steal the people's food, really. Yeah. I mean, they call them requisition teams, but really all it is is in the name of the king, you got to give this army food and the peasants are like, oh. All right, sir, because <laughs> we don't want to be killed. You know? <laughs> so it, it, out of that simple encounter, they just happened upon a requisition team where it's like they're carting away the food. Of course, these things, you know, there, it was a lawless time. These soldiers were like, you know, taking advantage of the civilian women. And obviously, you know, women's issues are like the big thing with Clarion and her gang. Mm -hmm. You know, they're going to stand for that. And she like, being a newly minted captain of the Naval Army, there she and her, you know, cousin in cousin in crime there, Jolfi, the wizard, they're like, nah, that's not going to stand, you know, as, as a captain, I'm ordering you to stand down and all that, obviously. It's a whole mess. And then, of course, they don't, they don't want to respect the, the, yeah. the newly minted captain because maybe she's a woman or... But I made it so that they're upriver, you know, like they're backwater people, <laughs> you know, like uh, the army does not respect people from the provinces kind of, you know, like they view them as hicks, you know, like small town sheriffs or whatever, you know, mm -hmm. the, your, your captain is not the same as my captain kind of thing, you know, the army captain, but they are, they are, but yeah. you know, it's just a matter of that. So I include a lot of that, like historical details. So obviously our heroes, they wipe out the detachment and suddenly there's a lot of trouble, you know, because mm. that detachment is belongs to a bigger army and now they have to stop that army, you know, <laughs> because that army is essentially sacking like a, like they're attacking an elven kingdom and they get involved in that war. <laughs> and to imagine, um, that's why I reference a lot of movies too, like uh, you've watched Gladiator, yeah. right? So yeah. in the last... The last few adventures, it's essentially literally glad the opening scene of Gladiator, where the armies are raided there, and there's they have like these large crossbows and all that, and mm -hmm. obviously they're fighting the barbarian horde, but the barbarian horde are like elves, <laughs> you know. So I got to do my fantasy booking of elves versus the Roman army kind of thing, nice. you know. So <laughs> it's a good fight, except our heroes just happened to walk into the middle of that and they unbalanced the whole thing and you know <laughs> suddenly suddenly it became a route for the imperial army and then the, their lord and master got killed and all that and uh. but see this is where characters just evolve and write themselves because originally i did not have any plans for uh, the aftermath again of that kind of encounter because in braveheart you're always like oh they're they're the English are defeated and that's it, right? Yeah. So, but you know, in my story is like, what do you do with the survivors kind of thing, you know? Because giant armies like that walk with a lot of things, like they got suppliers, they have cooks, you know, and all that. And the girl, one of the girls among them, the, the non-fighting ones, she's a noble. She's kind of like joined the group already, essentially. She's kind of like their representative or ambassador or something like that. Obviously, she collects all these surviving civilian elements of that massive army, and she begins interviewing them one by one. Will you be loyal to me or to your old master? That kind of stuff. So she goes through all of them, you know. So th those are things that you don't see in other stories, you know. And obviously, the you know when when she susses out that they they plan to uh, betray her at some point, betray their group at some point. They're just biding their time. She signals the she signals the muscle and goes, yeah, just get rid of that one. <laughs> there's there's that that's where the Game of Thrones walks in, because <laughs> there's always they have people among them that are work that are 
willing to just kill. You know, they do the dirty job that, that are, you know, she's a little saintly. Clarion and her gang are a little, they're still lawful good kind of thing. But they have a, they have these uh, members who wouldn't mind killing. So, uh, and I think uh, even the young noble lady, Herminia, she's 14. She's one, she's the youngest uh, member in the group, but she's very educated and uh, she can draw. <laughs> You know, she can draw, she can, you can, she can forge signatures. So she, right now she's forging signatures of her male relatives because they won't respect orders from a, you know, you won't oh, expect man. orders from a female noble. So she's forging all these names of male relatives to essentially effect orders and money transfers. Essentially, She's writing, she's writing what affects amounts of bogus checks <laughs> in that world, you know. <laughs> Because she got a hold of her brother's essentially scrolls and check his checkbook, <laughs> his imperial marks, you yeah, know, yeah. and all it needs is a signature. So she starts forging checks <laughs> in her brother's name, you know. So uh -huh. I'm going to address that later on. But right now it's a lot of fun <laughs> just having her do that. And every time they sack an army, she takes over the marking sigils of that army's <laughs> noble and starts making checks in his name too, you know. <laughs> so that's how she kind of funds their endeavor, you know. And uh, quite unexpectedly, that's how she got a hold of a giant fleet. So she's beginning to look like the Nares all of a sudden. <laughs> this Nares without the dragons, you know. <laughs> but suddenly she has, uh, you know, that inspired me to create a bodyguard core for her and all that. Nice. So it just balloons out of control after a while, as you can see. Yeah. One stop over in a town, it's all this yeah. stuff happens. Of course, the elves have to reward them, so they invite them into my own version of Rivendell. <laughs> you know, because you've you've done us a great favor, human. You know, kind of thing. <laughs> just like in every game, they, they, they get invited into the you know the, the elven kingdom, which is Rivendell, you know, or something. And then I have my own version of Galadriel because that's how we are as writers. We're like, I want my own Galadriel. Only mine will be a, a very friendly fae, you know, and she does. She does draw them into her world. And uh, you would want to stay there, except you don't want to stay there. <laughs> you want to stay, you want to keep adventuring, obviously. But yeah. But, yeah. So, so but, it's... Uh, unexpectedly, yeah, she did manage to snare a few of their party members. <laughs> So a couple of the party members are like, I need to stay here for whatever reason. But, uh, but really, she sort of drew them in, just so like Faye do. You have a lot to pull from, from not only your own interests, but of course from uh, from Game of Thrones and D&D uh, &D and everything like that. And as the story right. has evolved when, yes. when you first got into it, though, your characters are now speaking to you, which is obviously always a cool thing to deal with. How long do you see the series going for? Man, right now they're about to pull off the uh, Moses leads the, the slaves from Egypt, which is going to be gigantic. It begins with them just rescuing one prisoner. If you've watched Three Kings, have you seen Three Kings, that movie with, you know? Yeah, in the desert where they found the gold. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so the one with the George Clooney. Yeah. Anyway, just like Three Kings, once you rescue one person, you gotta rescue them all now. And it balloons out of control beyond their, beyond their scope. And suddenly they're upending the biggest city in my kingdom right now, which is New Elder Brass. And we've talked about, in, in, in the series, we've talked about New Elder Brass forever. Since the beginning of uh, the first issues, that massive city has been always talked about, but we've never seen it. And that's the whole thing about the world is that I, I keep mentioning it, but now finally they're here. And now their eyes are going to be opened. You know, <laughs> they're essentially, yeah, essentially it's going to end up with them getting the slaves out of Egypt kind of thing, you know, because they're shocked that, that, that this thing happens in such a civilized city, you know, but it is what it is. It's kind of like I pattern it after Rome. So you know, <laughs> they're essentially going to, to Rome, but it, but it's not yet Rome, so to speak, because uh, my whole story is Lord, sort of like just a uh, a colonial story, because this empire came from overseas, mm. so it's more like the British in I mean the the Romans in in Britain is how it is, you know, or to to put it more uh, accurately, it's like the British arriving in America. Mm. 
because um, because they have an ocean away. The, the, the main empire is an ocean away, and right now they're just dealing with the uh, with the colonial capital of the empire, which is New Eldergrass. So most of 2021 will be occupied by this citywide adventure. Kind of. so, so with all the one shots that you you did do, though, uh, is there yes. is there any of those that you know, kind of stood out to you like you didn't realize about this particular figure or this uh, about this particular historical figure? I learned a lot, actually. Um, it was quite an education. So when I, when, I, when I worked on Ben Franklin, I had to read up about Ben Franklin, even though I think I ended up not being, being the one who scripted that or George Washington, I still read the books about them, you know, so uh, so you learn a lot. So there's a lot of things that you learn about history. And one of them is um, we, were, we were really damn lucky in that Revolutionary War. I mean, people like to say that, oh, it's the hero heroism of Washington that won the day. No, he was freezing his butt off. He was about to quit. You know, and uh, every every day he was like, should I really quit? Should I, you know, this is useless. We're not going to win. You know, nobody wants to support us, you know, and all that. And we lack funds. My soldiers are dying in the winter. You know, it's it's a tale of a, a lot of misery that, that, that gets glossed over by the history books today. Mm. But uh, yeah, the only reason why we won is because the British were also busy and they 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 threw against George Washington like like just mere mercenaries. They're German mercenaries, really. <laughs> German mercenaries, because the British couldn't be bothered to fight the war themselves. And so the Germans were celebrating Christmas when, <laughs> when Washington said that would be the best time to attack. <laughs> mm. So it's those things that just always amaze me about history is like it, due to somebody's incompetence, the war was lost kind of thing, you know? It's like, man, if the British just paid more attention, really, we would have been smashed to bits. <laughs> you know, the, the Washington's army was holding on by the last thread. He, he had like 12-year-old boys manning manning guns. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, what? this is just absolute madness. But it just so happens the enemy was even more in worse shape, let's say, you know? <laughs> Probably they drunk. were also miserable. They were just hunkered down going, what are we doing? It's the middle of winter. Why are we here? You know, why are we so far away from home? It's the same story over and over again until today, you know. That's, so that's how they lost. They were like, we don't want to be in the in the colonies anymore, you know, kind of thing. <laughs> so, man, it's just it's fascinating that way, how, how armies win and lose, you know. So yeah, there's a lot, I learned a lot about that part, you know, um, human nature, I guess. And uh, in my in the in the one shots about the classics, because I worked on a lot of classical works by Edgar Allan Poe, you know, and I remember getting the uh, cask of Amontillado, and I read that as part of a project in school, and I go, oh, this is just revisiting something I did back in high school. So that was that was a treat. That was a treat. And because I was working in a manga style, a lot of these killer protagonists are now like young boys. <laughs> <laughs> Youthful, innocent looking lads that suddenly kill you. <laughs> so I got to enjoy a little bit of that. With your evolving art style though as well too, um, you're you're able to do a lot of styles, and I and I, I've loved your work from from when we first met, and from what I've seen you do. How have you improved your skill set with the ever changing style of of digital artwork? Yeah, that's a that's a very good question. I think I my skills took a quantum leap around the time I was working on the history books, was because I was forced to do accurate faces you know like i was actually conscious about trying to do a george washington face as best as i can even in a cartoon form or a ben franklin you know ben franklin's body that's how i 
that's how I got used to drawing like you know <laughs> the un unheroic like bodies like round round people you know so uh, that's uh it just expands your horizon that way you know now and then of course i also drew uh uh abraham lincoln you know i have to draw him sort of the he has to sort of look like lincoln you know so uh it got me a lot of practice that way and lately i've been practicing more on how to shade people's skin and faces so with my latest works with the Second Sight LLC, they have a lot of uh, they have a lot of black characters. So I'm learning how to draw and color really good um, brown and dark skin because there's there's slight differences. In the past, I wasn't able to notice this because I you know it was always like just flesh you know it's just light colored flesh this is what I'm used to coloring. But I'm like oh wait a minute. There's nuances in how to shade uh, properly, you know, uh, a black skin that'll that'll be accurate and that'll look kind of real, you know, or kind of right. <laughs> I don't know how to describe it. Just some of my past works, they just look wrong because I don't have that experience. But now that I'm gaining more experience, I'm like, okay, I can see where I made a mistake there. Or even in just features, like I'm practicing more on the facial features, you know, and you know, even even just uh, shading hair, you know. Mm. So a lot, you can learn a lot from new projects that way. With film, I mean, you're you're observing a lot of films and TV shows and, and everything True. like that. So you're seeing how you know traditional lighting and how how film lighting and how coloring, uh, uh, at least from right. a post production standpoint can change your perception of, of, of facial features and tones and all that stuff. That's the, that's the one thing I learned a lot when I went to, to into visual arts and film is like, you see how everything, how color corresponds with, with lighting right. and shadow. And it's really, it's kind of a cool true. thing to see. It is, it is. Uh, I got, I got a lot of practice that way, just working on new projects. Like uh, I work on a lot of projects and that sort of are private, private uh, visions of, you know, just regular people. I, mm -hmm. you know, I just want to make a book about my friend kind of thing. So I, sometimes I take those on, you know, or so, sometimes just this recent one, uh, I did a book about, he has a tribute book that he wants for his friend who was a retired policeman. So it's sort of like autobiographical in a way, you know? So I went back to biography mode there and uh, it has to be, it has to look kind of like the person, you know? So yeah. the most challenging one was this book that I worked on, which was about this lady's dog. And I gotta make uh, the dog look like her dog, you know? <laughs> Because <laughs> to us, like dogs look alike, you know, it's just a poodle, no different from other poodles, but there are differences and the owner will recognize her dog from another dog. So I, that was another challenge. <laughs> so that was, uh, that was I, 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 I passed that easily. So, nice. you know. That's good. Um, with everything that you've done from when you started your career to now, what are your top yeah. three favorite books or series that you've worked on the top three the, the first one let's see the first one has to be the stop tuberculosis project now that was i forget now how they found me but they found my contact and they invited me to join this contest sort of like a uh it's sort of like what do you call this uh it, it is like a uh, interview kind of thing to see if uh to see if you're the right person for the project, but if you win, you know you get you get a stipend and they they pay for the book and you know essentially it was organized by the United Nations and the uh, WHO, the World Health Organization. So uh, it was about how to uh, you know how to be how to stay clean and hygienic and how to get rid of tuberculosis. So uh, that's the book. It's an educational book. And I still tout it as my most widely printed and globally printed book in, in existence. I don't know if anything will, will beat that because that was 
published in so many languages that I got got copies in like uh, you know I got copies in like Indian language and in like a uh, Russian language so that was my most uh, printed book essentially <laughs> and I still love what I did there uh, because everybody else no, it was open to interpretation. Like uh, it was like it was led by soccer stars. Uh, uh, it was Luis Figo. I think he's retired now. Uh, anyway, uh, Luis Figo was involved with the tuberculosis movement, so he's like stop tuberculosis. So it was Luis Figo leading like a like a bunch of kids from different nations in his dream soccer team. Uh, against uh, the tuberculosis germs, and uh, and I in, I took inspiration from all the uh, ads that I've seen on TV. You know the Mucinex, yeah. <laughs> the Mucinex cough thing, like I'm I'll you know I'm the I'm the virus I'm the germ that irritates your throat. So I kind of I kind of took some of the design elements from that. Like I'm gonna make some Mucinex, you know, monsters except they're tuberculosis and. Yeah. I got educated real fast about how many types of tuberculosis there are in the world. Like I never realized, because to us, it's tuberculosis is just TB is just TB. But there's apparently like strains now, so many other strains of tuberculosis that you can make a team of tuberculosis germs on the FOCT. So, so there's like super tuberculosis apparently. And there's like a, there's, there's, so, there's tuberculosis regular, and then there's super tuberculosis, which is more viral or something like that. And then there's one that's like tuberculosis slash AIDS. Like, what? You're like, what? That exists? You know? Tuberculosis HIV, you know? It's like, what? How did that, how did it, I don't know. It's like, how, how did that happen? But apparently those things exist. So, uh, yeah, it's essentially the soccer team going, wash your hands, and then they score a goal, you know, and uh, avoid, uh, you know, avoid this, and they score a goal, you know. In the end, of course, obviously, they they win against the uh, tuberculosis germs, you know. Uh, obviously, in the middle of it, the tuberculosis start winning, too. Like, you know, <laughs> like I'm su su tuberculosis super enhanced or whatever they call, it, you know, I forget now. But uh, watch out for these germs, and you know, it's like, and then they, the tuberculosis start winning, and, and it's still very, very much my widely published book, and right. and I and I take at the time I was so happy that I worked in that that I said, you know what, I, you know, if that was my legacy, uh, I'd be happy with it. I mean, if it if reading this, some people it saved like ten lives. That that's already a big thing. So I'm like, oh, all right, this is uh, I can I can rest on that. <laughs> and this was uh, I was like 2007 or something, 2008, you know. And ever since then, I've done more books, but that that still I still remember that one, nice. you know, because that's my most widely published and most useful book. Second of second book, it would be have to be Courageous Princess, because it is it is very touching when some people tell you that. It helped them in their lives, you know, and I'm like, man, uh, sometimes you get those letters and you're like, oh, well, I'm glad I'm an author, you know. Um, it, it just changed that person's life, you know, it was very humbling to find out about that. And it's still my, you know, commercially best selling book right now. So uh, it's got that going for it. It's got a lot of staying power. It's been around since the year 2000. And uh, they're still selling them. So but thankfully, you know, that's why now I can say before this, you know, before this happened, I, I couldn't say pursue comics, kids. Now I can't do that because I haven't made it myself. Mm. But uh, now that now that having having a book that always sells, you can say to people now, quite honestly, to their, you know, I can say to them that, yeah, by, the, by all means, just... Uh, you all, you too can uh, do this because uh, I prove it and I've done it. You know, I mean, it's not Harry Potter numbers, but still, it's <laughs> it's still something. You know, yeah. so uh, I, I can legitimately tell people, yeah, definitely pursue your dreams because uh, 
because I, at least I have one book that keeps selling. So <laughs> it's good to, especially last year, the on years that you don't make a lot of money, and the courageous prince's money just keeps trickling in. That's still good, you know. Like a famous wrestler said, "Crumbs make crumb cake," you know. <laughs> so, little crumbs make crumb cake yeah. eventually. So, yeah, I like yeah. that saying. That's a good saying. So now I'm like, I'm uh, taking it for myself too. I want to <laughs> quote him. So, third book, ah, that's a that's a toss up now, because I. Maybe the third book would have to be my current series right now, because I never thought it would last this long. You know, Adventure Finders has really taken me to a lot of places that I didn't think uh, I would go to. So those are my three. It's, uh, it's great to see that you know you've taken a, a long career that you have and you've you've done good in the world, not only with the, you know the tuberculosis, but with your own personal self as as a creator i mean it's it's difficult to be an artist in itself but the fact that you're you're writing and drawing and you know still remaining relevant with your own self like i said before i wouldn't be able to say this if you know if it didn't happen to me that's why i'm glad it finally happened it happened late i mean it happens early to some people uh that's why i'm very happy when that happens to them because I said, man, at least you don't have to suffer for 20 years. <laughs> but I'm still glad that it happened, even if it's late. I'm still glad that, you know, finally my investment paid off. Because it would be embarrassing if it didn't, <laughs> but uh, but it did. So <laughs> I'm glad that it happened. With everything that you've done, with everything that you continue to do, is there any projects that you can talk about it that are coming up that you haven't signed an NDA, NDA on? There's several, actually. I'd like to do, well, I'd like to do more of, I'd like to develop more about on the Supermodel Girl uh, series. I just haven't nailed down a good story yet. Uh, right now, she just appears in small vignettes because that's that's pretty much it. I mean, she she really is the a mighty superhero that doesn't really give a crap, you know? She's very lazy. You know, she she's an online YouTube personality. She does gaming, but that's all she does all day. And that that was established in the first story that that's coming out in July through Antarctic Press. You'll see her first there, and that that's where they catch her. She's just gaming and you know, doing doing these raids. <laughs> she's not interested in saving the world. <laughs> in fact, uh, one of the characters are like. You're slaying monsters online. There's monster, real life monsters outside, kind of thing, <laughs> which uh, which I thought I was funny. You know, nice. that's funny to me anyway. <laughs> Another one that I want to revisit is, is I want to do my own space opera thing again. Uh, it's different from uh, Prince of Heroes. I just wanted to do a, a personal story about uh, one character. So it, this was inspired by. Uh, by well obviously it was inspired by the force awakens when i saw finn and i go well what's their life behind the scenes you know and of course you combine that with what you watched in robot chicken mm -hmm. and <laughs> yeah know, and suddenly you got a little series in your head going well this will be a series about just two stormtroopers what do they do you know and then and of course they're gonna be joined by this uh, sexy alien girl who was in prison and she was the, just like in Courage Prison she wasn't the one rescued the the Princess Leia of my series just hops off and does a thing and, and this other sexy girl is like wait I'm, I'm here help me <laughs> I'm in prison too and so you know it's kind of like the prisoner makes friends with the, these two obviously the Imperial base explodes but the three of them escape you know, that's all I have for now. <laughs> you know, but it could be interesting. You know, yeah. Yeah, I may want to like sort of follow, follow the the arc of the the Star Wars series, but just having them in the background. <laughs> <laughs> like, oh, the imperial the imperial imperial base law exploded. We got to get out of here, kind of thing. <laughs> and then uh, obviously they 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 get assigned somewhere cold. You know. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> week, week. <laughs> it, it, it sounds like you could call it space extras. Something like that. Yeah, something like that. I, I My working title was Imperial Trooper. Uh, Imperial Soldier or something like that. So space extras. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, it's uh, it's one of those, you know. And obviously, yeah, the girl was gonna be eye candy, you know, because you know, cause she's not a she's not a uh, she this alien does not believe in clothes kind of thing, you know. <laughs> so yeah, they end up in some faraway world where this the the, the alien kind of the, the alien girl is their guide there, you know. I don't know yet. You know, but they're going to be a, a trio, you know, they're going to be a trio, you know. Nice. And another one that I'm, I'm working on a personal project, but this is just me, you know, I, it's just a, uh, it's my Harry Potter fan fiction. And so far I've only in, in book one, you know, because again, I created a character, but it's paralleling the actual series. So it's what happens to this character as the series is progressing. So there will be touch points where she does come into contact with the uh, actual Harry Potter characters because she goes to the same school kind of thing. But, you know, it's like while this is going on, this other thing is going on here, kind of. You know, so and uh, I wanted to get to the point where it's in book seven, and she partners with Mister Weasley. And Mr. Weasley brings an AK-47 into the world. <laughs> <laughs> so that they they actually defend this other section that's also under attack. <laughs> and it's just her and Mr. Weasley, and Mr. Weasley brings a machine gun from the from the human world. <laughs> so that was it. That, that's all I have right now. <laughs> Everyone has one or two people that kind of inspire them on their path to where they are today. Who was that for you? Well, I was thinking about that recently because um, re remember when uh, I remember when, I remember when Sean Connery passed away, yeah. and I said, you know, that man had more influence over my life than other people have in my life, like my own relatives, you know, because they change your trajectory so much. So for that, for my list, well, the p two people would have to be like, yeah, definitely George Lucas and uh, Steven Spielberg, you know. I mean, they really shaped our lives. You know, I don't know, I don't know where I would be or what I would do, you know, without 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 their influence, you know. Uh, as far as literary goes, I'd have to say there's a lot of authors, but one of them is uh, Isaac Asimov, because the, the Foundation series really made me think, you know. I, I was at that age, at the right age, where I saw that series. I wasn't too young. I wasn't too old yet, so I wasn't that right age where it made really made the foundation series made me think about a lot of things. So yeah, well, that would have to be my three. From a professional standpoint, you've already talked about your three books in your career that have done extremely yeah. well and everything along that line. You've inspired people when it comes to tuberculosis mm -hmm. to better themselves to even inspire people looking at the your princess series and of course now with adventure finders as well from a personal perspective do you consider yourself successful from a personal perspective yeah i'd say i'd have to say yeah in, in a perfect world i guess you can you should view yourself as success even without the monetary part but in right now, I have to admit that the monetary part did give me a lot of, uh, it gave me a boost, so to speak, that, I, that this was the right choice to make, you know, because without that, I, you know, I, I would still think I was kind of like a starving artist, you know, that you never make it if you're still starving artist kind of thing. But now that, you know, now that you have that and you're making a good income out of it, 
And, you know, and I look back at my life and since 2009, I, I got my U.S. passport in 2009. That's why that was my benchmark. And from there, I just, there wasn't a year where I wasn't overseas. And eventually, I spent more and more time overseas than in the U.S. until now. You know, now that I got trapped here <laughs> uh, unexpectedly because of this uh, pandemic. But uh, usually in 2020 and, uh, and 2019, I, I went to so many places. And uh, and I have to thank my uh, career for that. You know, I have to thank my life choices for that, to be able to have me travel and work out of a laptop. I remember when I lived in Australia for almost a year, and I was courting somebody over there. That's why I moved, you know, and that alone is a big gift already that I'm able to do that. A lot of people, they saw, see someone online and they can't even follow up because they live in other countries. At the time I said, yeah, I can do it. I can, I can move there. You know, so uh, it was a happy, it was a happy 10 months. So <laughs> let's put it at that. But uh, yeah, those are, those are the things that you're like, oh yeah, you know, you, you made the right choice after all. The reverse of success is failure. How do you deal with your failures? Man, oh, uh, well, I had a lot of practice of that. So, uh, you know, when it comes to it, uh, even, even during the low points, uh, I still go, well, did I, I go back to the basics, you know, do I have shelter? Do I have food? And if I have those two things, I'm still okay. <laughs> so, yeah, uh, it just goes back to that. Never mind about, oh, I, I have like a five-year-old phone. Ah, that's okay. It doesn't matter. I mean, even now, I, I think my phone is like six years old. It already has a crack in the middle of the screen, but it still works, so it's fine, you know. I just had my uh, tablet's uh, battery changed, so... Those are the tiny things that you can go, well, at least you have money to have your, you know. But at the time, at the lowest points, you're like, yeah, you just go back to the basics, you know. Do I have friends? Uh, and uh, I guess it also helps that you're among a lot of other people that are in the same situation. So uh, so right now, I'm, I'm in the position to encourage others to go, you're not going to be poor forever, don't worry. If you work hard enough, you know, and, uh, and the correlation to that is uh, obviously I'm aware that in history, not everybody really makes a fortune during their lifetime. But I view that as like, well, you know, even Tolkien had his movie made after his death. So, uh, you know, just it just uh, happened that way. And uh, there's a lot of coping mechanisms that we can use. And mine, that's one of them. Just go back to the basics and go, well, you you know, if you have a significant other, if, you, if you're in a loving relationship, that's, that's something to treasure, you know. So uh, you just think about those things. You just count your blessings, so to speak. That's, that's how I handle adversity, you know. And even now, I can imagine myself, if I go back to that, will I be able to... Uh, Will I be able to handle it in, the, in my advanced age? I said, yeah, sure. You know, I mean, once you've been there and you're like, okay, you know, I just back to this stage again. So it's fine. No, I, I don't view it now as a uh, strike to your ego or something like that. I think that's part of growing up. Um, you're only here for like 90 years if you're lucky, you know. So you might as well make the most of it, you know. Uh, ever since I've been, I've I'm going to get a little spiritual here, or a little realistic or whatever you call it. But uh, ever since you, I realized that, okay, I only have 90 years. I don't have time really to get sad. <laughs> That's all it is. Is like, uh, you know, I don't have time. I don't have weeks. I don't have days to spend mulling around, uh, you know, feeling bad for myself. I mean, life's too short. That's the bottom line of it. So uh, I'll do whatever I can. I'll take a walk, you know, I'll, Try to enjoy myself. Do do something. Do something. If it if it costs less money, then that's good. You know, walking is free. Walking in the park is free. So uh, just doing things like that. You know, and realizing that we only have a short life. So do the best I can. 
the younger generation is looking at your work and they're becoming inspired to be either creative in their own right, whether it's as an artist or writer yeah. in content creation in whatever they want to do. How can they inspire the generation that follows them? Well, I, I guess uh, when their time comes, they'll probably figure that out because I never thought I'd be in this position where I'm the one now that people look up to. And I'm like, oh, wow, how did I get here? I used to be this kid that's like idolizing Jim Lee, you know, I, or, you know, uh, or uh, Al Williamson, you know, I used to be that kid. Now I am, now I'm becoming the, uh, <laughs> the, the, the the old Jedi, you know, <laughs> so I kind of, I, sometimes I like that role because I feel myself going, hey, I'm kind of like a badass Obi-Wan character, you know, <laughs> so, and, and then they'll have their chance too to inspire others, but uh, in my recent post, I, I, uh, I, I shared my niece's uh, YouTube, YouTube address there because, uh, you know, I'd like to say that I had something to do with inspiring her to do art, you know, and she's just in the pandemic, you know, she just created all these little videos with art and, uh, you know, she, 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 she made a lot of money, <laughs> you know, <laughs> she's on her way to becoming like a, one of those YouTube people that, uh, just go viral, you know, like you got 70,000 subscribers, you know, what? <laughs> you know? So my gosh, you know, like, uh, and, then the, and for whatever reason, right, uh, people just like her drawings, you know, so I, you know, so they're doing it. So some of these kids are doing it. One of them is my niece, she's 11 years old. Jeez. Wow. And the things that get really popular <laughs> you know but i don't understand it personally myself because i'm i'm becoming an old fogey now I'm like i i don't get it i don't get the uh the brand of humor or something but i guess a lot of people do so i'll just i guess it's uh <laughs> i guess it's the whatever generational thing so yeah it's, uh, it's amazing it's amazing that that they can do that so man so, but personally, I, you know, like I said, I don't, I don't compare myself or anything. I'm just glad that, uh, that I was able to maybe inspire her to do that. And now she's taking the ball and running, running with it. You know, of course, I obviously the animation part, that's all her. Cause I'm not an animator. I, I didn't teach her that, you know, but the animation part, that's, that she figured that out by herself, you know, so uh, I'm pretty happy that, uh, whenever somebody says, uh, I read your books when I was a kid and then I look at their art and they're like better than me. <laughs> I'm like, at least, at least I was able to go, ah, oh, man, at least uh, this, I set this kid on his way, you know? <laughs> so I, I see a lot of that now. So I'm like, yeah, so, uh, yeah, that's how life is. So I'm just glad to be able to in inspire people and uh, um, leave this world a better place, so to speak. Yeah, so. Nice. I like that. You know, Rod, I hate to say it, but before we let you go, I, I do. I got to thank yeah. you for coming on the show, truly, because uh, you know, oh, we, you're welcome and thank you. Yeah, we we we've talked so much about your career, and you're just such a talented person and a humble person as well, yeah. too. And and I can't wait to see what you come up with yeah. next as well. But before we let you go, where can we find you on social media and any other websites you'd like to promote? So I'm at uh, patreon.com, as you can see there, if you want to su support Adventure Finders, patreon.com. You're also supporting uh, me as an artist, uh, and you get a lot of, uh, on higher tiers, you get free comics, essentially. All my other past works are available to the uh, $5 tier and up. So you get, you get uh, free publications that you can enjoy on your tablet, I'm also at Facebook at Rod Espinosa, Twitter at Rod Espinosa. I'm occasionally on Pinterest, but I'm never there a lot because it, that's it's too much. It's too much social media at some point. I, I gotta sit down and draw books. So the only place that I'm most active is usually Facebook and uh, Twitter, and that's it. I mean, I've I have all of them like LinkedIn. I'm not active there either because 
So I'm only one person. So I, I limit my time and I have other things to do in the real world, you know. Uh, but yeah, that's, uh, you'll find me mostly on Facebook and on Twitter. I have a Deviant Art that's also around Espinosa. Uh, well, what else? There's I have a Tumblr that's around Espinosa, but again, I'm barely there. And I still have my MySpace, but my MySpace is still alive. <laughs> Every now and then I look at it, but yeah, nobody's there. Mm-hmm. But it's there, you know. Yeah, so that's great. That's that's where I am online. <laughs> awesome. I'd like to have I'd like to do TikTok, but I you know, we'll see what we'll see or what's that other one? Instagram. Instagram always confuses me. Like I want to post something on Instagram and then like, oh, why is not my computer working on Instagram? Oh, you have to use your phone. Yeah. Some people are like ah. Oh. Then of course the thought passes by and you know, yeah, that's it. You know the. Ah, you know, I don't have time to go to my phone. Like, you walk over there, you know. <laughs> so, even even TikTok. So is, yeah, uh, I'm mostly on Facebook. If you want to see me, you know, that, that I think I I think that's it. I'm not gonna move. I, I can't move all the pictures now. You know, how are we gonna do that, right? Too much time. How are, Mark Zuckerberg has us forever for life. You know. <laughs> We're not going to move all our photos to another place, you know? <laughs> How are we going to do that? That's like your album, your diary, mm-hmm. everything, you know? It's your life. Yeah, it's your life. So in the future, I'm always wondering about that. Like if the future people look and go, oh, this is what they did, you know? And obviously, it's more like a record. They see you speaking. They see us right now. They'll see Curtis interviewing thousands of people. And there's going to be this Curtis Sasso archive one day. You know, it's like, man, this, that's a lot of data. We're, even now, I'm amazed. Like, where, where, where are they keeping all this? There has to be some massive computers somewhere in the world. Yeah, it's, it's just amazing how they keep all this data. I have a lot of hard drives, so, you know. There you go. Yeah, me too. <laughs> yeah, um, but they're, they're also keeping a record of all your interviews. Somewhere. Right? I hope. So they're, they're somewhere in a server in, like, Washington or well, New York or Oklahoma, some, some, some farmland with a vast warehouse somewhere <laughs> yeah they don't have everything but you know they have they have enough on me so it is what it is <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, that being said rod thank you again for for coming on the show You're welcome. Uh, i really appreciate it like uh like rod said though uh look at his work check a look at his social media you know he's he's active in there support him through his patreon because he's done yeah. amazing Best work place to support me is patreon for sure so tune in next week for another great interview on two geeks talking uh all of may is going to be pretty much is is booked i'm booking into june currently i don't know who's up next but i know i have some interviews that i've done that are going to be uploaded uh hopefully on a more of a weekly basis um but that being said um thank you again for listening and watching take the time to subscribe like but like this interview comment on it below it really does help those algorithms and as I've said before in the past, uh, everyone has a story to tell, and it's up to me to help bring that out. And thank you again for coming on the show for Two Geeks Talking. Thank you, Kurt. Hey, all Kurt Sasso here from Two Geeks Talking. If you like this video and these quick clips here, make sure you take a look at our YouTube channel, youtube.com forward slash TGT Media. Make sure you hit the like button and subscribe as well. Hit the bell to make sure you get notifications, of course, from videos like this here. Thank you everyone for listening and watching over the years and keep listening and watching for new and exciting interviews with talented and creative people in the entertainment industry. I'm your host, Kurt Sasso. Thank you so much.